we are going to jump to culinary inspiration from Spain in America with a healthy dose of olive oil. We have two in fantastic chefs. We also have a wonderful moderator. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kathy Nash Holly, um, who's going to take us through the session. She is the publisher and editor in chief of Flavor and the Menu magazine. And before I forget, the recipes for this session are in the app. So you can go to the app to the agenda, find the recipes as well as on our conference resources. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Kathy. All right. Great. Thank you again. This is great to be here. And it's funny, all of my sessions have been in this room. So this is, I'm feeling at home here. Um, okay, great. Yes. As, as Shara said, we do have two wonderful chefs and really inspiring and and uh, good folks. So this will be really an engaging uh, session and hopefully we can have some nice Q&A afterwards, um, assuming there's time. Um, starting off, we know that uh, Spain has long been a, a, a one of the essential culinary resources for chefs around the world and heavily looked upon as an inspiration for American chefs in particular. Both of these chefs have ties to um, using Spanish uh, cultural and, and culinary um, resources to inform their menus. So they'll they'll weave that into their discussions. And in looking and getting going a little bit more granular in the ingredients coming out of Spain have been informing menus for, for a good long time now, but certainly taking up a notch in, in the quality of ingredients and the attention of ingredients that we um, that we look for. Um, so you're seeing things like all of these beautiful Spanish uh, pastes and, and, and purees and cheeses and, and breads and, and dishes um, kind of uh, fueled along by, by some of these champion chefs here. And Spanish olive oil has to kind of rise to the top when it comes to a resource um, ingredient that chefs here know and, and love. Um, do we have a video? to play here. Cher, shall we start that? Today is the day. I'm going to discover the best kept secret in the world. I come from the heart of Spain and I'm going to give you the best of myself, the essence. Are you coming to the fiesta? A journey of the senses. Let's go. Dream! You are the owner of the oceans and its creatures. I'm going to take you on a journey of flavor. Play! You can dominate the elements. I have come from the earth to convert your dishes into experiences, your food into life. Welcome to the food that takes care of you, olive oil. Cook, enjoy, laugh. The essence is now yours. Spain, where the olive oil is born. So that brings us to, to here. And you also have a book called Catalan Food, uh, published in 2018. So welcome, Chef Daniel Olivella. Thank you very much. And thanks for introducing me so well. Right, great. Thank you. All right. Um, good evening. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm sponsored by the Spanish Olive Oil Association. And in spite of that, um, I'm glad of working with them this weekend. But I use a lot of olive oil in in my dishes. It's one of the traits. It's how I obtain the part of the fat that I always want in, in, in a dish. I think that my food without a, that fatty base, it's like jazz without acoustic base. You know, without mm. that fat, mm. it's what rounds me in, in most of my food. I'm going to make two dishes today. One is a paella. It's a variation of a paella, which is called a rose negra. It's traditional from my part of the world, south of Barcelona. It's a dish 
uh, fishermen will go fishing, catch the coral fish and the squid, sell that, and when they were uh, fishing in the, the, in the Mediterranean, they would make a, a rice dish with the ink, because the ink was already something they were going to throw away. So it's a very traditional, traditional dish. And then the um, second one I'm going to make, um, I myself um, consume probably 95%, I think, about nutrition when I eat, and about 5% food. Um, I'm always surrounded by food, so I'm not even hungry most of the times because it's food, food, and food. So I started to eat um, almost vegan about three years ago. So I'm going to show you one of my dishes that I do plant-based, which it's done with lentils and a bunch of dry fruits and, and so on, but it's got a lot of olive oil as well. So we're going to start with the paella, and then we move to the, the lentils, and we go back to the paella, okay? Um, when you cook paella, and in my book I have a whole chapter that's dedicated to the paellas, uh, there is a few important things, and, and if you follow those guidelines, this is one of the most entertaining dishes that you can do uh, with, with people, with your friends, and you can showcase your talent, you know, in a, in, a, in a place that you have a big paella pan. It is important that everybody understands that the paella doesn't wait for you, you gotta wait for it. In other, in other words, today we, we made seven or eight of them, and I didn't cook them ahead. You know, I cooked them as I needed, because otherwise the rice um, overcooks. Um, it is important when you make a paella that you think it's a rice dish. It's not the dish about protein or about, about seafood, it's a rice dish. Therefore, the rice needs to, to swim with the broth. You can always add, we're gonna add some squid today, some mussels, but not in an abundance that the rice has no place, place to swim. So the, the, these, these few tips to start. So first thing, we need a good paella pan. This would probably fit two people, three at the most, no, no more than that. I got another smaller one here for maybe one person, those we serve at the restaurant like that. We make about eight or 10 different styles of paella, and they work great because um, it's an in individual size. Okay, so, um, there is a, a, um, a name in Spanish we call sofrito. You, you probably heard that from, from Puerto Rico, from Cuba, everybody, uh, all the Latinos, we, we make some, some type of sofrito. Sofreir means, freir means to saute, sofreir means to saute something very slowly. And every dish in Spain always starts with a sofrito. Sofrito of pepper, sofrito of onion, sofrito of garlic. And here we got three sofritos today. We got this tomato, tomato and onion sofrito, which is the basic sofrito that was obtained by sweating the onions for about two hours. This is one of the things I, I talk the most, and even if it's simple, this, um, this dish of, of, of onions, which they've been sweating for, they burn now a little bit because I had them in here uh, on heat, but um, this has been cooking for about two or three hours. This is almost like a marmalade. And I use a lot of this in layers of my food that nobody can see, but they exist in there. This is how, how I obtain my fat in my food. And if you eat this type of fat, I guarantee you that this is a good way to eat fat. You know, um, I don't use, I mean, I use butter in two or three of my dishes, but this is part of my, of my deal in my restaurant, the sofrito. So I got a, an onion sofrito here, which I wanted to show you. That, that, that was what I incorporated here. And then we have a, a pepper sofrito here. This has onions, red bell peppers, and yellow bell peppers, but the same process. You sweat them. I, I kept the lids on them because this is not caramelized. I started them with olive oil, a little salt, and then I cover them. And I tell you, this is, this is a great way. If you were gonna put some carrots here, some turnip, a couple more vegetables, and cook them puree, we'll have a great soup. So um, this is the three, three sofritos I'm, I'm, I'm featuring here today. We got some fish stock here, and this uh, squid ink paella has a, a combination of fish stock and squid ink. In this, in this case, I brought this, uh, we had some, I brought this from my restaurant, this is cuttlefish. Carol fishing, which is it's very close to, 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 to squid, a little thicker. And we use um, Spanish bomba rice. This is a very expensive rice. It's rice, rice should not be that expensive, but it's a very good quality rice. I don't use bomba, I use uh, extra, which is pretty good. The idea of bomba is that it, it allows to hold the marble inside for a longer period of time, rather than just opening up and becoming soft. So. Um, we, we're gonna we're gonna keep going, and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll walk back uh, um, back to to the paella. Um, so we got the ink, we got the rice. I make a picada here. This is a combination of garlic, parsley, olive oil, and water. This is another layer in in the paella. Then I make my own seasoning here, which is a combination of a very unique spice from Spain called pimenton, a little bit of salt, and black pepper. That's how I season my paella. 
This is the spice. I love, I love using it because there is nothing like that. This is a paprika, that type of paprika that has been fire roasted and smoked. So it brings a lot of, a lot of depth. And, and lastly, I'm going to show you this here. This is my rice that I've pre-cooked with a neutral broth and saffron. We do that in the restaurant because we go through so much rice, we don't have time to, to produce paellas fast enough. So I, I create this way of, of pre-cooking the rice, and this saves us about five to six or seven minutes of preparation. OK, so if you have any questions, let me know. We're going to put some green peas, and then we're going to dress the paella with a little bit of aioli, more, more olive oil. It's a garlic mayonnaise done with garlic powder in a mortar, or, um, a one egg yolk, and then olive oil drizzled little by little. It, it, it came out nice. Very, you can see it. Nayol is well done when the, mm -hmm. the, the spoon stands up like this. Mm -hmm. All right, so we, we're going to get the paella going, and then we're going to go back to the other dish, because time flies. <laughs> and let me crank this up. OK, so you want to make your paella pretty hot. We're going to use some Spanish oil. I got the broth hot already. We're going to put the squid. This should be enough. And see, needs more oil. At the same time, I put some of the parsley and garlic picada. All this is in my book. If you follow these steps, you're gonna make great paella, I guarantee you that. So some of the sofrito. This is the same we do in the restaurant, except we have every, everything in square bottles, and the guys do this um, in, in magic time. We're gonna put some of these, this sofrito we got here. I'm going to season it. I think that should be enough. And then we're going to put the amount of rice that we think is necessary for this paella. And that might be enough for now. And then we're going to put the broth. I'm just guessing. First time I, well, not first time I've cooked here before, but it was a couple of years ago. Anyway, while I'm doing this, um, it is great, as I said before, to be back with some kind of a normal life. This is my first um, performance or gig out, outside from the restaurant, so it's, a, it's honestly great when they call me to come here. I'm like, yeah, back to normal life. Mm -hmm. You know, I see a lot of faces, a lot of you guys, they know me from other years, so it's, it is great when you went through calling a lawyer to declare bankruptcy a year ago to now being here. You know, for us in this business, we had had a, a rough, a rough um, period. But um, luckily, with a pick and shovel, we're rebounding. I went from 36 employees to my wife, my sous chef from Guatemala, and myself, cleaning squid every morning, making food to go, which I hated it before. And that saved us. Mm -hmm. I was able to pay the purveyors. I owe money, and then we got money from the government, and we rebounded. And now we're busy. It's surreal what happened. But um, anyway, I'm going to let this be here, OK? You follow so far what I've done with the paella. If you make the sofrito right, sweat your onions properly. I mean, I would sweat my onions like this. Then I would get a can of tomatoes, pureed, add it in here with the water, and let it reduce, OK? Red bell pepper, yellow bell pepper, and onions with olive oil and salt. Another sofrito. Parsley and garlic picada over here. Seasoning, but pimenton, salt, and pepper. And then we got the broth, fish broth, with squid ink, all right? And a good quality of Spanish rice. And this, we let it be on its own. We're going to move everything out, except the aioli. And we're going to talk about, about my other dish here. Um, one thing that really, I think, and I'm sure you, a lot of people talk about it, um, we, we were taught about Corona, it's about how humble we can, we, no, we, I need this here, and the rest is fine. How humble and how vulnerable we can be, you know? So it is important for me at least not to take food for granted, 
and educate people as um, one, um, I'm, I'm a, a person that um, fits the Americans, so it is important for me to make sure I transmit the message of um, respect for food, um, and I think I'm an, um, I can prove that I'm a 60-year-old man, I ride my bike about 10,000 miles a year, and I'm in good shape, you know, and I'm almost mm -hmm. vegan, and I get all the food I want, so um, it is important for everybody, I think it's 2021, to think about that, about thinking that where, where the resources come from, and what we do for global warming, and eventually what you do for your inside, you know, your inner system. You know, the better you eat, the better your digestive, digestive system works, the better you, you're, you're energized, uh, you have better energy. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm in this crusade to convince people to, to not to stop eating um, pro animal protein, but to cut it down, you know, to instead of having a seven ounce piece of something and little vegetable starch, I mean, I, I went to the extreme to become vegan for two years, now I eat a little meat here and there, but um, you don't have to be vegan or, or you, I don't even like to call it names. I just want to make sure people understand you got to eat healthy and good, you know, properly. Otherwise, or, otherwise you kill your, your digestive system. At least be be generous to yourself and, and selfish, you know. When you, when you get a car, you put the best oil, when you got to put the best oil in yourself. Mm -hmm. So I created this, this bunch of dishes, which I, I sent to, I have a, a, a bunch of NBA players in my restaurant in San Francisco would come as a customers, and I send them my food, because a lot of athletes are vegan, believe it or not. So I make this very simple dish. I, I got five of them. I'm trying to see how I can put this in a package and sell it, but I think they're great. They're, the idea is to create these dishes, and to avoid, um, to avoid um, a taco, a burrito, a pizza when, when you're hungry for lunch. So anyway, I got some nice French lentils here. Okay, I have just cooked them with water and bay leaf. This is, it's very simple, everything. And I'm just gonna mix it, eyeball it, and I eat a lot of these. I eat a lot of these, a lot of these, um, these lentils weekly. Um, every time you think legumes, Legumes tend to be boring, you know. Oh, lentils, who's gonna eat lentils, you know? In Spain, lentils always serve with chorizo. You don't wanna be eating lentils with chorizo. So, anyway, I got lentils in here. This is a chiote squash, it's raw squash. I just gonna put it here and mix it with, with this. And, and I'm just eyeballing it, you know. I've, I've ate this enough times. Those are carrots, I have, have cut them and blanched them. So they're not as crunchy as they, they would be raw. Okay, I'm gonna put some of these carrots here. And then I have some uh, dry, how do you call this now? Fru not apricots, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dry apricots here. What I'm trying to accomplish in this dish, as simple as is, is that you get acidity, you get fat, you get crunchiness, and you get seasoning. So we're gonna put some of that, that's, that's probably enough. And then I got some sunflower seeds, I'm gonna put them at the end, and then I got two things here. I'm going to come back because I got to put the mussels there. This is a, 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 a acorn squash aioli. I roasted the acorn and then I, um, I put olive oil and I put a little bit of this um, um, blood orange vinegar. So it's like mm. an aioli without, without egg. And then here I have a, I call it this my, my, my white pesto. This is a combination of pine nuts, sweated onions, and tarragon. So it's gonna give a great flavor to this dish. So if you excuse me for one second, I'm gonna go back to the other rot negro because it's, it's asking me for the mussels. <laughs> so we go back to this here. You see, I haven't touched it. It's doing its own thing. And then at the end, if we want to bring it the socarrat, the crust on the bottom, we're gonna crank it up a little, a little more. Put some mussels here, we go back to that, that dish. And one thing, <clears throat> thank you. One thing I, I didn't mention before, this is, um, uh, I call it escabeche oil. Escabeche means to pickle something, but it's basically a pimenton oil. I infuse this with, um, with caramel, with some of the onions, garlic, bay leaf, and thyme. And then I infuse this for about three hours on the flame of the, uh, of the burner. There is a little flame that always stays on. So I put it on top, and then that's what comes out. But this is great, this is gold. This is, uh, this is the best fuel, it smells great. You put some of these in a, on top of anything, it brings a lot of uh, 
flavors uh, up. Yeah, I hope you're following me, right? We're gonna go back to this here. So we got the lentils, the carrots, the, the apricots, and the, and the squash. And once again, I make it, this is great. You know, this, this should be commercialized because it's, 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 an, it's a, a great resource of fat. Once again, we all love fat, you know? When you eat a toro, it's great. It's a bite of like explosiveness. When you eat foie gras, wow, it's like, man, this is great. So I think we all, we all love fat. You just gotta figure out how to eat it properly. Mm -hmm. And every dish, once again, this fat is what rounds the, the whole complexity of a dish. So I make, I make this with roasted garlic. I, I bake the, the squash upside down. Um, with, I season it with olive oil and salt, about 350 for a half hour, 45 minutes. Then I scoop the flesh. And then with the Thermomix, I pure everything. I put the roasted garlic and olive oil. So we add some of this. Just I boiling it too. Thank you. And then this here, once again, it's a combination of sweated onions, roasted pine nuts, and tarragon. Okay, we put some of this here. And that's pretty much it. You mix it, you keep some of the of, of the aioli. We're gonna get some some sunflower seeds. I'm gonna put some some of the pimenton oil or some or some um, some extra virgin, I'm gonna season a little bit. And then that's it. We just we just mix it. So so my idea of these dishes, of these bowls, is that to to get people into I just feel I just did a few videos for the University of Texas for the nutritional department about my vegan dishes or plant based. And it's nothing, it's simple, you know, but when you go to Whole Foods or in Austin Trader Joe's, I Trader Joe's uh, Central Market, most of the vegan food you find, it's salad, it's, uh, how you, I mean, it's, it's pastas and they're, they're things that, that um, they don't go to the direction that I want people to go. Mm -hmm. So anyway, th this is my, my, my lentil salad. Um, we're gonna, what are the bowls, the little two bowls here? You remember? Not, not those ones. Uh, we had two, two other ones, no? Where did I put them? Anyway, I'm gonna pay attention to my paella again, because I go from one part to the other. Thank you very much. So this is what I, I vacuum seal, and that's my lunch most of the days of the week, or, or either this, um, and I tell you, this, as simple as it is, you know, because it's very simple, um, it's not gonna give you any food hangover, and your digestive system is gonna work wonderfully, and the day after, you're gonna see it, it comes out, oh la la, like the, you're the king of the world, believe me, because, because at the end, at the end, the digestive system, it's the most complex part of your body. We worry about our heart, we worry about our head, but we don't worry about our digestive system. You get heartburn, you take a pill and you keep eating. No way, you gotta listen to your gut. <laughs> yep. And these dishes like this, honestly, this is food from 2021, I believe. Anyway, mm -hmm. this is my bowl. I, I make five or six for me and for, for some athletes and they love them. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just share this because it's part of, I think, what the direction we, we should all be taking ourselves a little bit. Or at least somebody my age, you know, if we wanna live <laughs> a little longer and happy. Anyway, I'm, I'm going back to the paella, which is almost finished here. You know, there is not much more I need to say other than um, if you come to Austin, come see me. You know, it's next week on Monday, I'm going to Barcelona. I keep educating myself. I'm gonna do two weeks with one of the best pastry chefs I know making desserts. Super excited to do that. Because I, I, I do the desserts in my restaurant. It's, if you hire a pastry chef, they change everything, so I'd much rather do it myself, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it, is a, it is a, I mean, I could tell you a thousand stories, you know, we, 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 we work in a very surreal, uh, cooks, we, we have a very surreal lifestyle, not the schedule, the schedule you get used to, you know, the schedule is the least, in, least complex, but the people that work for us, you know, the people that work for us, which is our team, the people that make us, me being here, Majority of them in the kitchens are, kitchens are undocumented people. 
that we turn our face somewhere else, all of us Americans, including me, and we're not doing anything to help them out. People, they collect the fruit in the fields, it's the same, have the same situation. The people, they're gonna wipe our butts when we're all, they're gonna come from the same countries. And anyway, the, 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 uh, say all that because when you own a restaurant, you, there is the layers of surreality that, that make it worth a while, but uh, you don't even acknowledge. Sometimes customers, they don't even see it. But um, we go through hell, honestly, to, to pay rent in, in, in a top spot that usually a bank would occupy. Rents are surreal, and then finding, finding stuff, that's the most complicated. My biggest asset, it's not knowing how to cook Catalan food. My biggest asset is I speak Spanish. You know, and I'm able to communicate with my cooks from Guatemala. I think that this is bigger uh, than knowing how to cook, because at the end, these people, they come from other parts of the world, make us better, I think. You know, I'm an immigrant. Mm -hmm. I was able to, to get here, one hand in front, one in the back, and now. But, uh, but also, um, the people from Central America are great, because a lot of them have grown up with their mothers and grandmothers, so they have a good sense for, for food. Mm -hmm. The surreal part is none of them wanted to be a cook. You know, they did it because there's a great job, so that's, that's the surreal part, because none of them argue with me. Yes, jefe, yes, jefe, yes, jefe. And I want somebody to say, no, jefe, this is no good. I, I got a better idea. And nobody comes with better ideas, you know? I told them once, I bet you amongst all 14 of you, none of you don't even know a, a, a single cookbook. Yes, jefe, no cookbooks in my house. So it, honestly, it's a... Uh, but it makes it like living in a, in a, in a movie a little bit, you know, a, a, a fictitious movie. I still have a minute and a half, and I'll cut it right on time for my paella. I didn't rehearse this, but I think I, I nailed it, you know, because it's an hour and minute 17, eh? my paella is almost ready. You can see not a lot of rice. You see, it's not too deep. Eh? Look, it's very, very thin at this point. I'm going to put a little bit, of, a few green peas here just to give it some color. I think I can... Turn it off. It is ready. I'm going to let it sit for a second. And at the end, I'm, I'm going to put a little bit of this aioli, which is basically, it's a garlic mayonnaise. This dish, um, um, as I say, I, I've done a lot of arroz negro. First time I made it, I thought nobody was going to like it. And it turned out to be one of the most I don't know, my trademarks, you know, because uh, everybody makes paella with chorizo, but uh, arroz negro doesn't seem to be um, uh, as popular, but when people see it, they, they, they like the, the brininess and, and the uniqueness. I'm going to drizzle this with some pimenton oil, okay, and then a little parsley. I got nine seconds. Right on time. All right, here you go. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. It's beautiful. Great. Nice job, chef. Thank you very much. And one, one, one advice. Eat little. Please, eat little. Mm -hmm. We eat more than we can. We throw so much food away. That's my only advice. Eat whatever you want, but eat little. Mm -hmm. There's always tomorrow. <laughs> All right? Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, chef. Thank you. All right, transitioning to our, our next, uh, next presenting chef, we have the lovely Isha Ibrahim. Um, Ibrahim, right, Isha? Have I got that? Aisha. Aisha, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm getting your, your last name, uh, you know, overcoming your first name there. Um, Aisha is the executive chef of Canlis in Seattle. And Canlis, many of you probably know of Canlis. It's uh, a long established uh, restaurant in, um, in Seattle that has, I think, a 70 year ish history now, right? 70 years. 70 years. And she was just recently appointed the restaurant's first female executive chef um, in, uh, in May, right? Um, Aisha comes from, uh, well, she's Filipino. She has studied all over the world, really, for your culinary education, if you will. Um, she was at Menresa in Los Gatos, Los Gatos, correct? Yes. Uh, and then spent time at Azer, Azer, 
Azurmendi. Azurmendi <laughs> in Spain, um, and then transitioned over to the same restaurant group in Thailand, correct? That's correct. All right, great. Um, and I read a headline in the Seattle Times, and I love this headline, um, why Aisha Ibrahim is the perfect chef for Canlis at the perfect time. And that was a, that's a beautiful headline to get. If you're a chef, you want that kind of headline. And the article goes on to describe what she went through, and your, it even describes your, your test meal that you made for the Canlis uh, brothers. And that must have been an intense process, but I don't want to take time away from your <laughs> demonstration. So welcome, Aisha, and we look forward to your demonstration. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being um, here. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> thank you so much uh, to uh, the olive oil from Spain folks for having me here. Um, you know, it's, um, I was kind of reflecting back on how much Spain has actually influenced my cooking. Um, my first head chef job was at the age of 24. I'm 35 now. Um, I had no idea what I was talking about, and it was at a Spanish restaurant. <laughs> so um, I quickly kind of rose the ranks in some casual dining restaurants in the Bay Area and, uh, you know, kind of landed this job as running a restaurant in the middle of the Mission District in San Francisco. Um, and it was intimidating, it was scary. Um, outside of the role, I had so much fun cooking Spanish food. So um, it's kind of fun to kind of come back to this place. And um, to be quite honest, you know, what one cuisine that influences me the most would definitely be uh, California cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, a majority of my career has been spent in uh, some of the best kitchens in California. Mm -hmm. um, Manresa and Los Gatos. Um, Comi in Oakland. Mm -hmm. um, we celebrate a lot of the same things that are celebrated in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, seasonality, sourcing local products, um, a lot of seafood. Yeah. So but it still informs me today, and honestly, it, it um, really helps me shape menus at Canlis even. So we source a lot of our products locally. Um, we work with a lot of seafood. My time in Spain uh, in Azarmendi was short because you know, I, I thought I'd be there for six months training with an echo, and after a month, he said, hey, you're ready. I was like, what am I ready for? Um, you're ready to run my restaurant. Take it. Take it. Thailand. Yeah. Wow. So um, I found myself taking the job in Thailand. Um, <clears throat> I was meant to kind of help him expand his brand in Tokyo as well as um, London, and, you know, I kindly said no to the London opportunity. I had just lived in the Bay Area for 10 years. I found them too similar, so... Um, I fell in love with the idea of living in Thailand and opening a restaurant there, and that's kind of where um, I ended up the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I bring that up is because cooking in Thailand, we tried to kind of work as I always have worked or have been taught to work, which is to work you know, as locally as possible, um, which meant no olive oil. This is so much fun to be back yeah, <laughs> um, in right, a country right. where I get access to olive oil because mm -hmm. We were building a restaurant program. Um, you know, we, we cooked 24 courses for 12 guests, which were different every meal. Um, and we were opening, we were planning to open a 12-seat restaurant. And uh, you know, it it was so hard to do that without olive oil after cooking in California for 10 years. Yeah. So um, we did cheat. We definitely had, always had a bottle of olive oil at home uh, with lots of bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so. <clears throat> Being back in the U.S., I find myself um, you, using some of this clean, like beautiful, fruity, nutty fat still in some of the foods that we're cooking. So one of the dishes I wanted to talk about today is um, uh, a dish that I'm taking it into its fall slash winter rendition now. This was on our summer menu, and this is a menu that we launched um, when we reopened the restaurant back in July. So it was originally done with summer squash, um, and also <clears throat> we, have, we had been using... Um, a more neutral fat, but for today and for you know just the purpose of the seminar, I really wanted to kind of dive back into it, and and um, uh, we still use Spanish olive oil at the restaurant. <laughs> right. So we, um, I want to talk about this dish just a little bit more. Um, one of the things that I love learning about in Spain, especially in my time in Azurmendi, was about sustainability, and that is a huge topic. It's a very vague topic in today's world, uh, food world specifically and how to express it without sounding like every other chef who wants to run towards that word. Um, we do a lot of things, you know? We try to kind of cut down on our waste in the kitchen. Um, <clears throat> we are trying to work with byproduct, and one of my favorite, um, by catch, um, 
also as sablefish. Sablefish, uh, also known as black cod, mm -hmm. is not a true cod. Um, it is such a beautiful fish. I find it to be something that is completely underrated. Um, so much of it goes to Japan and also is just underutilized on the West Coast. Um, the texture is beautiful. Um, this is kind of the perfect demonstration for this because, you know, when dealing with bycatch, a lot of the times this product is not treated with the utmost respect. So you'll often find this at the market and you'll find kind of punctures and wounds and things like that, but it doesn't make it less of a product. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm getting too ahead of myself here. Let me back up and talk about this dish. The dish is um, sablefish. We are curing it in shio koji. We're producing koji at the restaurant right now. Um, koji is very exciting. We use it uh, in shoyu koji. We use it in pickling. We use it in curing and marinating uh, vegetables, fish, poultry, pork. Um, <clears throat> we just did a 72-hour cure with shio koji on a pork collar the other day, and it was just beautiful. So. Mm. This is, uh, hasn't fermented for long. Um, it's basically koji that we produce, salt and water. We leave it anywhere between two to 12 days, just depending on humidity and climate in the restaurant, and also what we're looking for in the product. Um, <clears throat> so what I have here is already finished. Um, these are two pieces that we've cured for, we don't typically cure for this long, but because this is so young, I left it for 48 hours. Um, it really helps to firm the product and also helps us to um, bring out some of the sweet and savory and umami kind of profiles of this beautiful fish. Um, I wanted to break one down for you today. It's one of my favorite things to do is break down this fish. I don't even have Western knives. This is the only Western knife that I have. I usually work with Japanese knives, but um, for this particular fish, um, I've been using the same knife since culinary school. Wow. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> We do a lot of fish butchery at the restaurant. We're experimenting a lot with um, fish aging. Um, we've taken things as far as 33 days on salmon. Uh, we're aging, you know, roughly between 6 to 12 days on some of our raw courses right now. Um, and just kind of understanding, you know, what these healthy windows look like, how to, how to optimize products that, um, you know, we've kind of been seeing in the market for a long time. So the last three years in Thailand, I've been experimenting a lot with um, fish aging, um, koji curing, and it's so much fun to kind of bring that to canvas right now. It's great. Um, <clears throat> so when you're breaking down fish like this, it's a little bit round. It's not quite a flat fish. Uh, what I do is use my towel to flatten this fish and create some elevation. Um, Uh, because this fish has a more of a round kind of belly here, um, I generally have the same process for breaking down a lot of these fish. And it's usually belly and then straight across. But for black cod, I do belly. The first cut I make is usually a little straight down here. <clears throat> kind of just carving here. And feel free to ask any questions as, as I'm kind of doing this. I have a question about the koji. Yeah. So you use, you use the, the koji rice salt and then filtered water? Yes. Um, that that we do. We, we, we place that into, so what we do is um, sometimes we make a mash and sometimes we just puree the whole thing. Uh, we place it in a sterilized container or like a mason jar. Huge difference. Uh, Seattle's super blessed with very soft mineral water. Um, so I don't know if you know that, but I found out when I took the job, so I was really excited. <laughs> that was a, we make a that lot was of a condition, at the right? restaurant. So yeah. um, this is so weird because you know when I was beginning to cook, every cook wanted to either end up in Spain or Japan, and I ended up at both, luckily. Um, and they influenced my cooking a lot. Um, I find so many similarities between Spain, Japan and California cuisine. Um, we celebrate a lot of the same things. Sustainability is very much in the forefront of people's thoughts and like how we're planning food these days. Um, and also, um, you know, light, clean flavors. Uh, I don't tend to use a lot of heavy fat. I really stay away from dairy. Um, I think for me personally, those days are pretty long gone where we all leave a meal and feel like gross, right, you know? I don't want right. to walk out of a meal after three hours and feel like I can't walk to my car. Um, yeah. I love 
finishing a meal, or I love when guests are feeling nourished but still happy, you know? Um, so, <clears throat> so the order for this fish for me, uh, I really did this so I had an excuse to cut more black cod yeah. because it's one of my favorite fish to cut. Um, <clears throat> the first cut here is a little bit more downwards and a lot of what we do at the restaurant in terms of kind of teaching butchery and some of these important elements of cooking is to make sure that every protein cook who works at stations also knows how to break down a lot of these proteins. I think a lot of that is going away. It's pretty in interesting at a high volume restaurant like Canlis that we're able to do that. Um, we do 160 covers a night. Sometimes we do 160 plus like 70 um, in private dining. So wow. for that volume and for us to be able to sustain doing a lot of our butchery, I think it's important that these cooks are understanding and getting touches on these things. You know, if you want to really build the strengths around fundamentals and yeah. in the kitchen. Look like nice clean cuts. Nice clean cuts, kind of all the way through. Mm -hmm. And what I do is come back through here and just break through the rib cage. <clears throat> then we'll come back through and remove this set of bones here. So. What ends up happening, and I'm going to kind of just uh, mm -hmm. point this towards the camera, wherever it is, right. <laughs> is um, there's a kind of triangular shape at the center here. Um, I use my knife and basically create a foundation of that triangle and like break through the rib cage. This allows us to kind of maximize our yield and stay away from that protein. Um, <clears throat> so this is what I was talking about in terms of, a, you know, this is a bycatch and for as exceptional of a product as it is, oftentimes you'll find the sable fish pretty beat up and pretty torn up. And it's, um, it's amazing what 48 hours of shiokoji can happen, you know, can, can do to this protein. So <clears throat> um, I'm not going to take this kind of all the way, but just kind of the initial steps of breaking down this fish is something that um, I like to teach at the restaurant and I feel like is important to discuss. We, you know, try to standardize the ways of like, how we fabricate fish and all of our meats there. Mm -hmm. So these are our two fillets right here. Um, what I would do after this is basically break the top loin, the belly, and then what we do is apply the shiokoji using a brush and uh, plastic wrap. So um, we would lay out the plastic wrap, we would brush the surface of the plastic wrap, we would lay on the loins, and then brush it once more, again, pretty generously, mm -hmm. and you kind of just want to roll it a little bit like a torsion. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and then this kind of keeps it compact, uh, makes a lot of even contact, that stays refrigerated, um, and it really depends on what, like, you know, what firmness are you looking for, right. what texture, what, um, how much sweetness you want to derive from the rice. So, what are your timing windows on that? How long um, do you leave it? What are the you know, range? Anywhere between two hours to 24 okay. hours. So you can do it as, 48. It as quick yeah. as two. And yeah. it depends on how powerful this is. Right. Um, if this is a day 12 and it's crazy, um, you know, you might want to go for two hours. Okay. Um, if you have a large cut that is, that it's going to need a little bit more time. It's going to yeah. be, yeah. So, Interesting. um, I think this is one of those kind of new techniques that people are like really kind of curious and wanting to learn more about. Right. And, um, I love the use of rice and koji in our cooking. It really influences right. us a lot. So, Great. um, perfect. I have a question. So when, once you get the koji to the stage that you want it at, do you, can you refrigerate it then? You can freeze it at that point. <clears throat> um, also, one, one thing I discovered, which is really cool, we work with a local brewer in Seattle, and he's producing his own koji. Um, what happens is, uh, as that temperature is kind of fluctuating and rising, uh, when the koji is um, during the inoculation process, it actually, um, there are points where it becomes a little more savory or the, the profiles change a little bit. So what we're kind of working on now is um, getting to a point where we can produce very, like specific kojis within specific windows. Um, we have a roasted koji cream in one of our first courses, but you know, to drive more of a Parmesan profile versus mm. something that's a little bit mm -hmm. sweeter and funkier, 
Um, that just depends on the window in which you pull your koji. So the temperature that it's hit, which is pretty fun. Hmm. Excuse me one second. That's okay. Yeah. Cool. In the conversations we've, we've had, I like, uh, one of the things I really like about your style is you're very functionally um, yes. invested here. You, there is a function to every ingredient and every process, correct? There is absolutely a function. And um, I don't mean function as in like, I, I see olive oil as just a, an oil. It's right. not a fat, right. it's a complex fat. For right. me, the, the reason why we chose um, two styles of albarquina in this dish is because mm -hmm. They are so friendly with almond, right? Mm -hmm. um, they each have kind of a, a variation of like almond profile for me. One is very bright and fruity and overripe, and the other is a little bit young. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's you know more of a kind of um, uh, friendly stage. It's not yes, it's nothing right. that's powerful, but also plays very well with the with the profiles. Of Nuanced this. and subtle. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. Um, and you know, for me. Um, Everyone is asking, like, what is the style of food? I'm like, I don't know that yet. I know it's a progressive form of cooking. I know that we're, um, you know, I definitely take from a lot of my experiences in Japan and in Spain. Um, so we, we, we haven't quite defined that. We're yeah. working with kind of redefining our, or, you know, we're kind of playing with what is Pacific Northwest cuisine in 2021 yeah. Yeah. with the product that we have um, and my perspective. Yes, um, right. I got to put my mom's eggplant on the menu, which is crazy because the only people who got it in the dining room who found so much comfort in it were Filipino Americans, which is really great. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I want to talk about this condiment that we have at the restaurant right now. It's called our wildflower condiment. Uh, I think it's a really fun way to capture and celebrate um, both this olive oil as well as, uh, you know, seasonality. What we're tasting here is kind of late spring, so we work with various foragers at the restaurant. Um, they'll bring us things like black locust flowers or elder flowers, elder mm. capers, um, coriander capers, uh, fennel fronds. Um, and we create infusions in oils, mostly neutral, not in this case and also in vinegars. So we use like very neutral or bright, um, like white balsamics. Uh, I'd love to be starting to make our own vinegars here soon. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so what you're tasting in this dish and what you had just a little bit earlier when I served this dish was um, you know, just a reflection of late spring. Um, as flowers change, the profile of this changes, we adapt the fish, we adapt the level of fat and complexity in the dish. Um, I served that with an almond crema uh, almond crema was um, just kind of whole roasted almonds. We uh, cooked them down with Walla Walla sweet onions. Have you guys heard of the Walla Wallas? Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. um, there's another, I get really excited about this. Uh, there's another process we have at the restaurant where we take Walla Walla onions and we basically caramelize them all and cook them down for about three days. We press that and cook down that liquid and it's just a natural sugar. We call it our molasses and nice. we, we lacquer a lot of our meats and fish in this. And we sometimes utilize um, neutral fats or sometimes bold fats in that, um, or smoked duck fat or smoked pork fat, and just reincorporate it back into our product. But um, it's amazing. Uh, you know, when, when you're looking at products and you're looking at function, um, that's really what I mean. It's like right. looking right. at, you know, what is the profile of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this is a reflection of late spring. Um, I think, you know, with the almond crema and the, the kind of reduction of the, um, almonds and the onions and that process with the olive oil, uh, it kind of comes together pretty nicely. Um, I'm going to put one of these dishes together. In the late summer, we were using summer squash, and right now we're using a variation of pumpkin I was just very recently introduced to. It's an heirloom variety called Winter Luxury. Um, it's, it's a high sugar pumpkin. We did not do a lot to it because it doesn't need a lot done to it. Uh, it's very sweet. It was traditionally used, um, I think, back in the 1800s in like pumpkin pies at home. So mm. very, very beautiful. So it's an heirloom, it's an heirloom variety. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start off by heating up my pan here a little bit. This has been treated with uh, shiokoji. So I want to be very careful in treating that skin properly um, <clears throat> because of the sugars that come from that process. Um, so this, instead of going up to high heat or medium high, we're going to kind of start it a little bit lower here. We start with the neutral fat. Mm. 
And this has also been tempering for a while. So when, whenever we're cooking fish at the restaurant, it's really important to kind of temper your fish. That means to bring down the temperature so it's, clo uh, it's uh, close to tepid or room temperature. Um, <clears throat> it really helps with high fat fish too. Um, that albumin release is really coming from like a huge um, temperature difference. So um, that albumin quickly releasing like that comes from just not tempering your fish properly. Huh. Wow. Uh, we rest our fish sometimes when we do a pre-sear and um, we do a lot of various treatments that I kind of picked up in Japan and kind of geeked out in like Cantonese cooking kind yeah. of along the way. So um, we do treat the skin in just various ways at the restaurant. This is typically uh, charcoal grilled, but I couldn't get a charcoal grill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we're looking for when we're kind of building dishes is really just balance. Um, balance of flavor and texture mm -hmm. and really trying to respect the ingredients as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm searing fish here, um, I like to apply pressure. I'm not pressing, I'm just kind of keeping it as flat as possible. This is my lucky fish spatula that survived the Manresa fire in 2014. Ooh. <laughs> Anytime any cook bars is I'm like, do not lose that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite uh, offset spatula. I wish you guys could kind of come up here a little bit closer and smell this. You can really smell the sugars. Um, mm -hmm. I'm saying come up. In this process, and you just want to be really careful not to overcook the skin. And it will, it will blacken very quickly. The amount of sugar from this process it dramatically changes the, the sugar content. What are you watching for here? So I'm watching for, whenever you put fish down, the, the initial reaction of fish is to kind of seize. You'll kind yeah. of see it coil. Yep. Um, unless it's a beautifully aged piece of fish, it, it has less of a tendency to do that. Um, <clears throat> You want to make sure that there's even contact with the fat in the pan, um, but also that it's not going too high. I'm super conscious of the, the sugars here. Mm -hmm. Simil yeah, absolutely. Um, I never cook fish anymore that I don't salt cure ahead of time. I tend to kind of salt cure all of my fish. Hmm. Um, whether we're serving it raw, uh, you know, we're serving raw halibut at, on the menu right now, it's like six to eight days is usually the window that we serve it in. Um, and right now, like, we're kind of trying to calibrate palates and noses, so um, teaching sous chefs who have never smelled like you before, um, what, to, what are they smelling for when they're aging something? Um, you know, like, what is a healthy fruity smell versus an unhealthy fruity smell? What is a healthy... Um, you know, funk versus an unhealthy funk. And I'm also looking for that nice crispness. Um, oftentimes when you don't age something for a long time, you, again, I was talking about that coil that happens. That's why you apply that pressure to the fish. When I'm flipping, uh, flipping my fish as well, um, it's pretty quick. I try not to kind of flip it too much. I usually take it almost all the way on one side, but because of the sugars on this fish, I want to like make sure we're moving it around and not over caramelizing one side here. Mm -hmm. So you want a nice, nice, beautiful brown color. And uh, we have this kind of small smoker that we set up at the restaurant next to the line, and it's, um, it's, we usually stuff it with hay, uh, the wheat straw that I was talking about in yesterday's eggplant demo. And um, we light that very quickly and stifle it with the proteins inside, and it gives it a nice hint of like beautiful, gentle, sweet smoke. And um, nice. you know, that's, that's really how we like to kind of finish a lot of our proteins. Mm -hmm. 
Your attention to detail and your intention with every dish is really impressive and it gets me a lot in a lot of trouble at a restaurant yeah. that does 160, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was first offered that job, that was my biggest hesitation was like, is this like, you know, is this going to be okay or conducive to the way that I cook? Um, right. And I'm, right. I'm, I'm really liking um, the challenge of having to like, to do this for 160 people, but also having to teach a lot of cooks. Yeah. We have a large kitchen. Yeah. We have 20 plus cooks in our kitchen right now. We are blessed to have 20 plus cooks. I don't Amazing. know a lot of kitchens who have that. Um, and we just hired someone last night, which is exciting. So. Dan Dan <laughs> Daniel Olovella is gonna be talking to you after this. He's gonna try to poach some of your, your team there. Nobody likes Gregor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, um, and, and it's all over the world too. It is, uh, I have yeah. to say, like, I thought for sure Europe wouldn't be in as much trouble as we are, and I'm getting messages from friends all over who are like, "Hey, do you know cooks?" Wow. And I'm like, I would like to know cooks if you have them. Right, right. I'm gonna pull this off here uh, and let that residual heat finish cooking it, um, and finish it with a little bit of salt, and then I'll start building this dish, just so you guys can see. Um, <clears throat> It is, yeah. um, but I still like to finish it. It's just kind of a hint of salt, and there's a little bit of sweetness as well. So I want to make sure that um, we still finish it and it's still seasoned properly. So I was testing it because I was very paranoid about that before the demo. <laughs> um, and how we build this at the restaurant is really, we kind of pre-shave these pickles here and build them before service. And depending on like the profile of the squash or the pumpkin that we're using, um, we do and don't wave it over charcoal. Sometimes we want to drive up the nuttiness of that profile. So we kind of just wave it a little bit over the charcoal. Um, this is, I want this to be exactly as it is because it's such a beautiful pumpkin. I'm so impressed by the, the sugar levels. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna plate here. I start off with a little bit of the almond crema. We create a well in the center here. And this is that wildflower condiment. So this never stays the same, which is fun because mm -hmm. your seasons change with fish all the time. Mm -hmm. So you get to adjust the level of fat and acid you're using to it. Do you usually stick to florals there? Um, or do you do greens or microgreens or herbs? Usually florals. I mean, yep. this is just like, this is just how we capture fish capture. in general, yep. or sorry, uh, flowers in general. Yeah. Um, I brought my temp stick out here, and I don't know if you guys ever use this trick, but when you're looking at, you know, perfection and, and like fish cookery, for me, starting from the thicker part of the loin to the outer part, um, I usually take this temp stick and push it through. There should be zero resistance. And then also, you can be testing for the temperature inside. It should be nice and hot. Yeah. So, yeah. If you ever see cooks doing that on the line, that's what they're doing. Interesting. Um, so what we do is kind of lay this out, have it ready to go. And then we just kind of wave this around and hide everything. So the crema holds it in place, really, right? The crema holds it in place, and also mm -hmm. um, kind of everything coming together is a whole lot of just like fun and texture nice. and um, complexity. Uh, yesterday we got these beautiful kind of amaranth flowers, and these are great. You can um, leave them raw like this. I like to kind of fry them sometimes as well too. So kind of just drape them along here, finish off our dish. Sometimes uh, in the late summer we would have some squash blossoms. Mm -hmm. So we would t take those and bake them into like beautiful kind of like very, very thin chips. So. Okay. And that Did is anyone it. taste this during lunch today? Yeah. I, I know I. Really I beautiful. It. Yep. Incredible. Great. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank Aisha. you.
Thank you so much to both of our chefs, and thank you to Kathy as well for your moderation. Thank you so much to Olive Oils from Spain for your support of our conference and this session.